go. All right. Afternoon, folks. We'll be getting started here in just a minute. Uh, all right. Thanks for joining us on this uh, cold, damp. Uh, well, early winter day, it seems like. Uh, we'll be getting started here in just a minute. And since there are a, a few of us here, I figure I'll, I'll give you all a, a sneak preview of next week, because uh, just in time for Halloween, we're going to be talking about sky monsters next week. Among them, this little fella. This is a 50 million year old bat. And uh, what's kind of neat about this particular fossil is just like a modern bat, you can see its wings are made up of elongated arms and fingers. And actually, by 50 million years ago, they're already fully developed, completely capable of powered flight. He would have looked very similar to a modern bat, except he's got a longer tail than most modern species do. <clears throat> and, uh, well, that little fella is by far the smallest of the sky monsters we'll be talking about next week. So, looks like we're at one o'clock. So, uh, I want to say thank you, everybody, for joining me here at Colossal Fossils on this uh, kind of cold, gross day. Uh, glad we don't have to go out in this weather to present everything to you to bring you to the museum today. Uh, so welcome to uh, Colossal Fossils. And uh, <clears throat> I will make sure that at the end of the program today, we have plenty of time for questions to get a closer look at some of these fossils. We got a lot of neat stuff to go through. Uh, today's program is sea monsters. So uh, if you'll allow me the terrible joke, let's dive in. Um, <clears throat> So last week, uh, we talked about the first life, the earliest sort of creatures, you know, wormy guys and mollusks and such that, uh, that evolved in the oceans. And well, we're gonna take off, or pick up rather, more or less where we left off. Um, today, we're gonna start in the Devonian period uh, that's about 418, 420 million years ago. Now, in the Devonian, um, things are starting to get interesting. We've got all of the ammonites, um, you know, all of the orthocones, the squiddy type creatures we talked about at the end of last week's program. You know, some of them getting massive, as big as a school bus. Um, but the Devonian starts to see a real expansion of a group that's very important to our own existence, the fish. Now on land during this time, we're getting plants and the first bugs are coming out of the water. Things like sea scorpions are uh, coming up onto the shore, presumably to lay eggs uh, like modern horseshoe crabs. And they slowly but surely evolve some primitive lungs as the, the newly evolved plants start to oxygenate the atmosphere. In the ocean, uh, fish that started out like the modern hagfish, and hagfish are actually a holdover from this, this time, 400 million years ago. They, they really kind of look like a cross between a fish and a worm. 
uh, hagfish, they're very slimy, they're very eel-like, um, they're, they're a very primitive fish. They don't have really jaws. They, uh, when they bite, they kind of suck onto a piece of uh, you know, rotten meat, they're scavengers, and they actually twist around their body to pull that piece of meat off. They can't bite like we do. They're very primitive cartilage skeletons and uh, they're just a gnarly, ugly fish. But this group started to diversify and we ended up with ray finned fish, with bone skinned fish, and with lobe finned fish. We're going to talk about all three of those groups. First off, uh, well, the ray finned fish. Uh, I assume I'm not the only one who likes to go fishing when the weather's nice out. You know, go fish off the pier in the summer for bluegills and things like that. You guys probably catch bigger fish than I do. Yeah, there's a couple of hands. All right. Now this, this isn't quite 400 million years old. This little guy would have been swimming around while T-Rex was doing his thing. But this is a ray finned fish. And just like any modern fish, it's got fins, it's got a well-developed skeleton, lots of fine light bones. But ray finned fish, they use these, we call them rays, they're little tiny bones that support the fins. And that allows their fins to take on all different kinds of shapes, be very strong, but still flexible. And this group includes things that range from tiny little minnow, minnows at the fish pond, all the way up to uh, massive open ocean predatory fish, things like sailfish and marlins and tuna fish. Um, most of the fish that we have in the world today actually fall into this category. Now, uh, we're going to talk about some bigger relatives of that little guy in a little while. Now, the cartilage fish, the cartilaginous fish, are still around today. They're a very diverse group. Uh, they include fish that we might find at the fish pond, like uh, bullheads, mad toms, catfish. Uh, but they also include things like sawfish, stingrays, manta rays, and of course, sharks. The bone skinned fish, uh, we call placoderms, are extinct. They were a very early variety of fish, and in their day, they were the dominant species of fish in the ocean. Now, this is a tiny little baby, I'm gonna stand up because it's heavy, of a very large, very impressive fish called Dunkleosteus. Now, Dunkleosteus was the largest of these placoderms, these bone skinned fish that we know of. They could be up to 30 feet long, weigh as much as four tons. That's about the same size, a little bit bigger than a modern great white shark. They were around uh, between 360, 380 million years ago. Now, these fish are very well known from their front half, much, much less so from the back half here, but uh, oh, that's because they're heavily armored. The back half is uh, you know, more skin and uh, bone, uh, more like a, a modern ray fin fish, but that front half is solid. The largest individuals could have armor more than two inches thick, solid bone. Now, there we go. We take a look at this. We can kind of get a get a look at the, the shape of him, get an idea of how it's all put together. He's got these large jointed bone plates. His head is solid. When he swims, he's going to swim kind of like a tadpole, right? He's got his tail out the back. And he is an active predator. Now, Dunkleosteus has some interesting adaptations that we've been able to discern from the, the fossils. Uh, for one thing, it was so heavily armored that its eyes were actually armored, bone eyes. It only had little tiny holes in the bone armor for the pupils so that it could see. But it had spe special muscle adaptations and bone adaptations in here 
so that the jaws on this fish could snap open in a fraction of a second, very, very fast. And uh, we see that behavior, that type of uh, ability in a lot of modern fish, things like catfish and bass, uh, they open their mouth so quickly that it creates suction and it pulls a bunch of water in the mouth, usually with the prey item. And then the Dunkleosteus can snap its mouth shut again. It has a super quick open and close action. Now, we look at our little model here. His teeth, there. Let's see if we can get that to focus. His teeth are big plates, big blades. Come on, there we go. Uh, but they're not actually teeth, not like ours. They're armor plates, just like the stuff on his back. And when it closes its mouth, they overlap. So they're, they're self-sharpening and they shear together like a pair of scissors. We think these animals had a bite that was comparable to T-Rex. They were the apex predator, the top predator in the oceans during the Devonian period. And they were eating other armored fish. With that bite force and those shearing jaws, we think they could actually just slice right through the plate armor on other fish. They were probably not something that you would want to catch uh, if you were out on the Devonian seas. Oh. Fish, like our very heavy Dunkleosteus there, the bone skin fish, lasted for quite a while. Uh, we now think from looking at the, the structural uh, makeup of their armor that they were actually able to store minerals uh, in their uh, in their armor plating, in particular electrolytes, things like potassiums and magnesiums, things that are uh, important to the bodily functions of uh, animals today, even like us. Uh, if you've ever been working out in gym class really hard, you know, drink some Gatorade, that's full of those same electrolytes. We actually think uh, in hard times or where uh, they're having trouble finding uh, some of those minerals that they need for their normal body uh, bodily functions, they could actually sort of digest or absorb minerals into the blood from their armor plating. So it was sort of a, a multi-purpose shell. Now, we move forward in time a little bit to 362 million years, we get into a really neat period in Earth's history called the Carboniferous. The Carboniferous is called that because it is a distinct layer in the strata, in the, the rocks that we use to tell what time period it is. The Carboniferous is usually a black layer because there's so much carbon, that is charcoal, from forest fires. By the time we get to the Carboniferous period, plants on land have exploded. And we have massive, huge forests just constantly pumping out oxygen. The oxygen level got so high, in fact, that lightning strikes, a single spark would almost cause an explosion in fire. And so forest fires were very, very common. Uh, so common, in fact, it left a black layer of carbon in the geological record. Now, because of those high oxygen levels, some really interesting things happen. With things out in the, the ocean fish like that Dunkleosteus and even the, the very earliest sharks, there was a lot of competition, there was a lot of predation. And so smaller fish started moving up rivers and inland, ending up in swamps and ponds and marshes and bogs where they could get away from those large predators and evolve independently. Now, some of these fish that went up the rivers ended up getting quite big, but uh, one group in particular called the tetrapods or lobefin fish, uh, rather, sorry, they called the lobefin fish, they evolved into tetrapods. Tetrapods are animals like ourselves that have four limbs, you know, four arms, four legs, what have you. Now, well, these fish 
are working their way up on land, things are getting kind of interesting. We don't have any dinosaurs yet, don't have any birds yet, don't have any pterosaurs yet. In fact, we don't even have any amphibians quite yet. But during the early Carboniferous, the bugs have gotten massive. There were spiders up to three feet across. Think like a manhole cover on the, on the street. There were scorpions more than five feet long, centipedes and millipedes as long as your couch, more than 10 feet sometimes. And what we call griffin flies, a type of dragonfly that got to be as large as a modern day eagle, a six foot wingspan. The oxygen levels in the atmosphere were so high that even despite these massive sizes and very primitive lungs, these arthropods, these bugs and insects could get to be massive. There's actually been experiments done today to see if we can uh, take a, a small population of let's say beetles and put them into a super high oxygen environment. And when we do that over a few generations, they do start to get big. Now, these high oxygen levels were very, very important to us, or rather our very earliest ancestors, because they allowed some of these fish in scummy, muddy waters and swamps and marshes to gulp air. Now, this is a behavior we can see in modern fish. Um, things like bowfin and gar will uh, swim up to the surface when the oxygen in the water gets low, and they'll gulp and swallow down a big bubble. And that goes into their swim bladder. And most fish, the swim bladder is something that helps them float just enough that they don't sink to the bottom. It keeps them neutrally buoyant. And they can expand that or contract that by filling a little bit of uh, gases in it. And it makes them float up or sink. If you've ever watched fish in a, a fish tank, sometimes you see like my, my goldfish will just sort of float up to the surface a little bit without moving their fins much. That's the swim bladder. And some of these fish, particularly lobe fin fish like lungfish, this swim bladder developed into a sort of a primitive lung. It allowed them to breathe. Now, over time, some of these fish actually left the water and they developed into the very first amphibians. Now, this little guy, I'm going to try to pronounce this group name correctly. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. He is a Temnospondylus. Now, this group includes a number of early, very primitive amphibians. Some of them we don't think even really left the water so much as uh, were able to come ashore and kind of bask a little bit, get away from predators, but really stayed where they were. Uh, some of them were very capable of leaving the water. Some of them even survived well into the Mesozoic alongside the dinosaurs. There's one species called Kulosuchus. It looks like a salamander, but it's about 10 feet long. And we think it may have even preyed on dinosaurs like a giant amphibian crocodile. It lived in Antarctica. Now, to be fair, 110 million years ago, Antarctica was a little warmer than it is today, but this group was incredibly successful. The largest of them looked very similar to this little guy, was a Prionosuchus, more than 30 feet long. And it behaved very much like a modern day crocodile, except it was an amphibian, like frogs and toads and salamanders. Temnospondyls even includes a group of animals called aerops. And aerops got to be the most a uh, widespread vertebrate animal in its day. It was uh, <laughs> sort of the base of the food chain for large predators. If we take a look at this little guy, we can see some neat things. First off, he's got a little hole in his skull here. Uh, that's actually a light sensitive spot on the top of the head. It's not, uh, not exactly a third eye, but it allows them to sense the intensity of the light overhead. It's an adaptation we see in a lot of uh, fish and reptiles, and we think it probably helps them to uh, find a good basking spot to sort of thermoregulate. Now, their eyes, 
are well developed. The nose is on the top of the head, very much like a crocodile. And we think they hunted a lot like a crocodile, except instead of stalking prey on shore, because there's not a lot for them to eat on land, I think they buried themselves in the mud with just their face sticking up like that. And when, say, a fish swims overhead, it pops up and chomp. Uh, more or less like a modern day alligator snapping turtle or a soft shell turtle. And they are well adapted fish eaters. You can see on the inside of the mouth here, we've got lots and lots of sharp teeth. Very much, uh, very much more potent bite than a modern day frog. Now, some of these animals actually even evolved small holes on the top of their snout so that fangs on the lower jaw could fit through them so they could have huge uh, fish catching teeth and still close their mouth. Now, amphibians uh, tend to be carnivorous. Uh, today we don't have any herbivorous amphibians. In the Carboniferous and a little bit thereafter, they got to be a very diverse group. Some of them even went out into the ocean, which we have no saltwater amphibians today at all. Uh, modern day amphibians give us a pretty good idea though. These guys were probably voracious predators. Uh, things like bullfrogs, for example, have been known to attack birds, snakes, and mice. Uh, some frogs in uh, areas where they get larger, like South America and Africa, are actually strong enough that they can bite a person and draw blood. They're powerful predators for their compact little size. Now, some of these amphibians developed kind of a neat trick that becomes very important to us. During the Permian period, um, around 300 million years ago, this started. Now, amphibians are, are tied to the water. Uh, does anybody go out to the ponds and the fish ponds in the summer and uh, you know, catch tadpoles or you know, chase after frogs, that sort of thing? A couple of you? Yeah, I always, I always loved doing that as a kid. But uh, if you see frog eggs or toad eggs, they're always attached to the weeds along the shore, you know, but still in the water. They look like strings or globs of kind of black speckled clear jello, uh, really gooey looking. They cannot leave the water. Those eggs have to stay submerged. They have to stay wet. If they dry out, then the little, uh, little amphibian embryos will die. Uh, during the Permian period, we start to see the first reptiles. Now, these were a group of amphibians that developed the ability to grow shells around their eggs. And so they could lay them in the sand on the shore. They could lay them in, in moist soil and not have to go back to the water. They also developed scales that helped to keep their insides you know, soft and juicy while their skin was dry. Where if a frog, uh, if its skin dries out, it actually can't breathe. It absorbs a lot of its oxygen through its damp skin. So these very first reptiles, of course, are important to us because later they develop into pterosaurs, into birds, into dinosaurs, into early mammals, and eventually way down the line into us. Oh, well, this is happening on land. The Permian sees an incredible development in the diversity of sharks. Now, sharks are amazing animals. Unfortunately, I don't have any Permian era sharks. So we're gonna jump ahead in the timeline a little bit, but I think you guys are gonna like this. First up, we have a really fairly small tooth for this animal. They did get bigger, but this is just a really nice fossil for this. If I can uh, get us to focus here. Sorry, the camera's being a little stubborn today. Let's try. There we go, I think we can see that all right. So this is a tooth from a shark called Otodus. And even though this is uh, around 30 million years old, this is a very sharp fossil. Uh, this is a close relative 
of a modern great white shark. There we go. You can see, unlike a great white shark, it's actually got two little teeth, one on each side. So each one of these teeth has three bitey parts and the whole jaw ends up looking like a saw blade where it, where it has little tooth, little tooth, really big tooth all the way across. And what that means is like a modern great white shark, when Odotus feeds, it takes its jaws and it bites down on its prey and then it shakes back and forth. And that back and forth action means those teeth function just like a saw blade, just like a rip saw. Like I said, Odotus is actually an ancestor of the great white shark. They could get up to about 40 feet long. That's the length of your school bus plus uh, most of the length of a car. They were huge animals. And they evolved uh, as the sort of the earlier member of the great white shark family at the same time that the marine reptiles like seals or marine reptiles, sorry, marine mammals like seals and whales were really starting to get established in the ocean. And just like the modern great white, they primarily fed on uh, marine mammals. Fast forward a little while, a few million years, and we get to an animal that I think many of you are going to recognize. Uh, this tooth is from another relative, another member of the great white shark family. This is a rather modest tooth from a Carcharodon megalodon. A megalodon, is an awesome fish. We don't actually know for sure what it was shaped like. We think because of similarities in the parts that we have found and its close uh, family ties to great whites that it was very similar in shape and behavior to a great white shark. Sharks are cartilaginous fish. They have a cartilage skeleton, so they don't have hard bones. Uh, if any of you watching or don't know what cartilage is or what it's like, uh, if you touch your ears, they're kind of stiff, they're kind of hard, they hold their shape, but you can, you can flex them, you can move them. They are cartilage inside. You don't have a bone in your ear like the rest, like your skull, for example. So a shark's entire skeleton is made of that cartilage. And because they stay in the water their entire lives, their weight is supported so they don't squish their skeleton. They can, they can do that, but it does not fossilize well. So where we have lots and lots of megalodon teeth, the rest of the animals got a lot of guesswork to it. We think based on larger teeth like this one, that megalodon could be more than 50 feet long. If you look, this, this tooth is as big as my hand. And they would have had more than 100 of these teeth in their mouth for an animal this size. Now, uh, at 50 to 55 feet in length, up around 10 tons, you're talking the length of two school buses. That is longer by 20 feet than the largest Tyrannosaurus rex that we've found. Now, the neatest thing about Megalodon isn't that it fed on full-sized whales, and we actually have whale skeletons. We're talking bones like this. That's just a single vertebra from a humpback whale. Are those bones that actually show teeth marks from the Megalodon where it bit the animal and left gouges in the bone. But Megalodon didn't go extinct until about 12,000 years ago. So there is a very, very good chance that some of the first people to come to North America by way of the Bering Strait, the Bering Land Bridge across the North Pacific and down the Canadian coast in like dugout canoes and rawhide boats could have actually dropped a fishing line in or a net and looked over the side of their boat and seen a 60 foot long shark with teeth as big as your hand swimming underneath their boat. Now that, that would make you want to get out of the water real fast, wouldn't it? Now, sharks have developed into 
a whole myriad of different types. They inhabit every level of the ocean from the bottom of the deepest oceans all the way up to the shorelines and the surface waters from coast to coast in every ocean. <clears throat> They're an incredibly successful group of animals and they're highly adapted predators. They have good eyesight, good hearing. Some sharks like great whites, what we call mackerel sharks, are actually able to maintain a body temperature higher than that of their surroundings. Not quite warm blooded, but sort of a primitive first step toward that, which allows them to keep a higher metabolism and be more active than other fish. Sharks even have sensors along the undersides of their snouts around their noses that allow them to sense electricity, electric current. And that means that just by thinking, just by moving your muscles, they can sense that, even if they can't see you at all in complete darkness. And they use that uh, in a lot of cases to find things that are hidden in like mud or murky water. They're amazing animals. Now, the end of the Permian, something happened, and we're not completely sure what. We think it was probably caused by large-scale volcan volcanic eruption. Uh, we call it the Great Dying. Uh, the Great Dying is the largest extinction event in the existence of life on Earth, uh, something to the effect of 95% of life in the oceans was wiped out. And uh, most researchers, most paleontologists think that it had to do with a drop in oxygen levels, which again was caused by volcanoes and uh, some what we call red tide and things like that. But that is, that is 19 out of every 20 animals in the ocean, gone. On land, it wasn't quite as severe it was three out of every four animals, 70% of life on land of vertebrates wiped out. Now, the great dying at the end of the Permian was extreme. I mean, it just wiped the slate clean. But by doing that, it opened up opportunities for a lot of really neat things. Among them, the very first mammals on land, our first ancestors, the first pterosaurs, a big group we're gonna talk about next week, and the first dinosaurs, of course, things like Herrerasaurus, Eoraptor, Coelophysis. The Triassic period also saw the first marine reptiles. The first group it's kind of a, an anomalous group because we don't know exactly where they came from. Sharp fossil. Uh, the first fossils of ichthyosaurs we find are already fully developed ichthyosaurs. They're fins and swimming tail. They, we don't have a transitional species for them, which is a little unusual for something like this. Now, ichthyosaurs, and this is a small one, were really amazing creatures. They looked a lot like a modern day dolphin in a lot of ways. They'd swim like sharks do with uh, side to side action on their tail. We start at the tail end here. We can't see it really well in this fossil, but the bones on the tail have a downward kink. And then they have a lobe of cartilage that developed off the top. And that gives them a very shark-like tail, very shark-like appearance. Now, their fins, like in modern dolphins and seals, we move forward a little bit, are actually very specialized feet. You can see the front one's a little better, all of the toe bones in the fin. Now, as they've evolved to leave the land and go back to the sea, their, their fingers, their walking feet, have turned into swimming feet. And eventually, they turned into fins, where they just fused all together into a single flipper, like a modern day dolphin. They have huge eyes 
very good eyesight, and we think they're very well adapted for seeing in dim water, maybe at deep ocean depths. They have a long jaw filled with tiny needle sharp teeth on this one. But some of these animals, like Shaniasaurus, got up to more than 50 feet long. They were as big as modern whales. There's even some trace fossils, some trace evidence that they might have eaten, even gotten up into the 80 foot range. Now that's approaching the size of a blue whale today. But these guys are reptiles. They still breathe air, but they can't leave the water anymore. They're completely adapted to life in the ocean. And they were a very diverse group. There was more than a hundred species and they each developed uh, sort of their own diet. Some of them ate other ichthyosaurs, other marine reptiles, large fish like sharks. Some of them specialized in hard shelled uh, ammonites and belmonites like these guys. Um, in fact, our little, uh, our little model representation here is munching on an ammonite himself. And because they couldn't leave the water anymore, they were actually the first reptile we know of that developed the ability to give birth to live young. Now, there's a few reptiles, a few snakes today that do this, uh, but ichthyosaurs, they couldn't lay hard shelled eggs on the ocean floor and they didn't lay eggs like amphibians do. So they would actually give live birth just like modern mammals like whales and dolphins do today. We've actually found a fossil of one that was in the process of that when it died and got fossiled and fossilized and buried. It had the uh, uh, infants or whatever, the young ichthyosaurs inside the rib cage when it fossilized. Now, ichthyosaurs are an excellent example of something we call convergent evolution, where they look like sharks because they evolved in a similar environment doing similar things. And just like sharks, they got very good at it. In fact, ichthyosaurs were so good at it that after the great dying, when the ichthyosaurs went into the ocean, they actually became the dominant predator. Ichthyosaurs existed from 250 to 90 million years ago, all the way through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. And we'll get to why we think they died off here in uh, a couple of minutes, but they were very successful animals. Now the Triassic also uh, brings us a, a really gnarly group of marine reptiles. Now where the ichthyosaurs are out in deeper water and uh, fully adapted to the ocean, the nothosaurs can still come on land. They're sort of more like a reptilian seal but they are the ancestors of some of the great Jurassic marine reptiles that we think of when we think of the oceans during the Mesozoic, during the era of the dinosaurs. Now this little fellow is a hatchling, he's very young. Uh, something stepped on him or grabbed him by the tail and probably tried to eat him. And for whatever reason, it, he got away or it wasn't able to. Uh, but we can see some really handy aquatic adaptations in him. Now his feet, his limbs are short and stout. They're very strong. And we think from trackways that their, their toes were kind of fused together, not quite as tight as like a dolphin or an ichthyosaurus flipper, more like a modern seal or a sea lion where it can still come out on land. Those bones can still spread, but they're fully webbed. He has very powerful legs. They're very well muscled and he actually uses his legs and his arms to swim. Now this particular species has a long, very flexible neck. It's got more than 20 vertebrae in his neck. We only have seven. And his head is a little bit wide, a little flat and it has lots of very, very sharp little teeth. When he closes his mouth, those teeth interlock like this. Uh, very much like a modern day garl or gable. It's a, a crocodile that specializes in feeding fish. Uh, if you've seen them, they have a very long, narrow snout, lots of teeth that all interlock like that. Now, his big brother over here took a slightly different tact. Many of the same adaptations 
but a couple different. This species still has a fairly well-developed tail. You can see the, the bones here for muscle attachment. I mean, he was using his tail to swim. The feet and the limbs are heavily muscled. They're very strong, webbed all the way across. He's very well adapted to an aquatic environment. He's got a tapering, smooth, narrow shape. He's very hydrodynamic. That means he's a fast swimmer. Well, this one has a somewhat shorter neck and he's got a longer toothier jaw. Much, much more like that modern garl uh, crocodile. Now these guys, these animals are not crocodilians. They're their own group. And uh, well, the Nothosaurs, they diversified somewhat throughout the Triassic and they started spending more and more time out in the ocean. At this stage, they still came out on land and laid eggs. Some of them got to be quite large, up to 25 feet long. And well, they had gnarly, gnarly teeth. On Nothosaurus, the species that the whole group is named for, the teeth in the front of the jaw and halfway back on the top jaw were long, were super long. In some cases, more than six inches long and they all interlocked. The smaller teeth interlock the same way further back, making their mouths into a very effective fish trap. Now their skulls were long and flat and we think they, they probably swam along the bottom looking up for prey. And then when they got close, they'd use their long neck to put their heads up and you know, kind of strike like a snake almost. Now later in the Jurassic period, uh, if you remember when we talked about Stegosaurus and Allosaurus, the sauropods, big long necked dinosaurs, that is the Jurassic. By the Jurassic period, the dinosaurs are in full swing, massive animals, some of the largest land animals that have ever existed. Uh, huge super predators like Allosaurus and Megalosaurus are hunting the, the giant herbivores. Overhead, we've got some very early, still kind of primitive pterosaurs like Ramphorhynchus, who I'll be talking about next week. But we're getting the first pterodactyls in the ocean the Nothosaur group have diversified. We still have ichthyosaurs swimming around, but they're not the top predators anymore. We have plesiosaurs, which are the long necked sort of uh, Loch Ness monster type marine reptiles that we'd think of. And the plesiosaurs got to be a very successful group. They behaved, we think a lot like modern day sea lions. Some of them were probably even able to come out on land and lay eggs just like sea turtles do. The largest of them, Elasmosaurus, got to be more than 40 feet long. 30 feet of that length was neck. And then the Pleosaurus, like this big toothy guy, looked almost like crocodiles with flippers, except we think from, uh, from fossilized skin impressions that they were dark uh, black and white colored like this, uh, not too dissimilar from a modern day orca and for the same reason. It's a type of camouflage we call countershading. Now, animals like Leopleurodon and Chronosaurus, the Pleosaurus, were the top predators in their oceans, up to 30 and 40 feet long in some cases. They were massive, huge animals. And they swam by undulating their flippers, their front and back flippers would swim up, uh, flap opposite like this so that when the front one is, is pulling them along, the back one is pushing them along and then vice versa. So they were very quick, fast swimmers. And they held the dominance in the ocean over sharks and ichthyosaurs for about 75 million years. It's not until we get to the Cretaceous that they're knocked off their throne. Uh, for those of you who have, uh, have seen Jurassic World, you're gonna recognize our next fossil. Uh, I want to introduce you to the Mosasaur. Now, mosasaurs are awesome for a number of reasons. Uh, first off, 
they're actually related to modern day snakes and monitor lizards like Komodo dragons. There's some debate on which one they're more closely related to, but really uh, at some point in the late Jurassic, a lizard, very much like a, a Komodo dragon or a, a water monitor, probably to escape danger from animals like Allosaurus or uh, Salorus, these predatory dinosaurs, or even pterosaurs, well, it started going out into the ocean. And by the time we get into the Cretaceous, they developed into an apex predator. Uh, this is the lower jaw of a mosasaur. And as you can see, it's a, it's a good sized jaw. This particular species has very robust, strong, sharp teeth. It had a powerful bite like T-Rex. Now, uh, the largest mosasaur species that we've ever found is called Tylo Tylosaurus. Tylosaurus probably topped out at around 40 feet long, about half the size of the Jurassic World mosasaur. There are some fossils, some fragments and pieces that seem to indicate that there were animals that could get up to almost 60 feet, about the size of a modern humpback whale. Still not as big as the Jurassic World mosasaur, I'm sorry to say. That one, they had to up the size so it was big enough that it could just easily take on their magical imaginary Indominus dinosaur. Um, now, these animals had good eyesight. We don't think they had a good sense of smell. Some reconstructions show them with a, a forked tongue like a snake. We don't think that they had that, that they used that. There is some evidence that they had actually evolved to be warm blooded. Uh, the, the growth rates and the bones, the way the blood vessels uh, come together, and the fact that they show up in, well, cold water, subarctic waters, from Antarctica to the Arctic all around the globe, is an indicator that they may have been able to regulate their body temperature. But they were aggressive predators. They ate absolutely everything. They were air breathers. We think they, they hunted mostly near the surface, but they would eat uh, early ocean birds of the time, fish, squids, ammonites, uh, pterosaurs, even other mosasaurs. The part in Jurassic World where they jump out of the water and attack the pterosaurs, that could actually happen. Now the species I'm gonna introduce you to here next, this is Platycarpus. Now Platycarpus is a little bit of a specialized animal. And of all the different species of Mosasaur, they ranged in size from uh, six to eight feet long, up to 40 plus feet. Each different size, each different group specialized for a different prey item. So they didn't generally compete with each other. Platycarpus here is specialized for slippery, fast moving prey. Things like squid and fish. And you can see he's got longer, more needle-like teeth. And when his jaws close, those teeth interlock. They, they line up in between. So he's got that fish trap mouth, but Platycarpus has a, uh, a neat trick that many of the Mosasaurus had. Behind his big eyes here, in the roof of his mouth, he has a second set of teeth. Look at the camera. You can just see, there we go, back here on either side, He's got teeth behind his teeth. I'm just going to hazard a guess here. Uh, none of you guys have extra teeth behind your teeth on the top of your mouth, right? Like you press your tongue on the top of your mouth. It's just the top of your mouth back there. I hope so. Mosasaur, like Platycarpus, when it caught something that was slippery and fast, it didn't want to let go of it, it could bite and swallow its prey whole without ever letting go. It would swim up, catch its prey in its mouth, clamp those jaws down, and powerful jaws, then 
underneath here, it sticks its tongue up and presses the prey, whatever it's got in its mouth, up against those teeth. That allows it to open its lower jaw, pull its tongue back a little bit, and then close its jaw again. So by doing that, it never has to completely unbite to open its jaws as it swallows its prey item whole like a snake or a monitor lizard. Absolutely terrifying predators. Now, the Mosasaurs, the Platycarpus, its relatives are, are really neat fossils because we actually have some that are so well preserved, we know what their skin looked like. And not just the fact that it was little kind of pebbly scales like a monitor lizard, but we have a pretty good idea of their color. And they were very similar to modern day orcas. Now, we don't have the full body. So my illustration there has a little bit of artistic license to it, but we know they had very dark, almost black skin on the back and very, very light whitish skin on the belly because the protein structures in the, the scales that gave them color were still existent in the fossils that we found. So we can compare them to the protein structures in modern cells and scales and actually figure out the color. We've done that with a couple of dinosaurs as well, things like uh, Cynosauropteryx. Now, at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, Mosasaur was the dominant predator, but it wasn't the only uh, well thing you'd have to worry about if you went scuba diving. In the Cretaceous, uh, for those of you who, like myself, enjoy a little fishing, I would like to introduce you to the most terrifying fish ever produced by nature. This is the head of Zephactinus. Now, Zephactinus was a massive, super aggressive, super voracious predator. These fish got up to 20 feet long, just like the little fossil fish I showed you before. These are ray finned fish. Their body shape was very similar to a, a swordfish or a marlin today, kind of almost a, a tuna fish shape. They were long powerful swimmers. They had narrow, strong uh, fins, what we call caudal fins, the tail fin, so they could swim very, very quickly. They had a mouth built somewhat like a modern day bass, where they could open their mouth up very, very wide. This fish could swallow prey almost as large as me. On some individuals, the teeth were up to six inches long. And we have actually found fossils, uh, a number of fossils where these animals died eating. In one case, it died, it tried to eat a fish that was too big and it choked. We actually found one fossil of a Zephactinus that ate so much, it popped. It literally ate until it burst sank to the bottom of the ocean and fossilized with its last meal hanging out of it. Kind of gross, but kind of crazy, right? One fossil found not too long ago even had the flipper of a mosasaur in its mouth. And it looked like it attacked the mosasaur, ripped its fin off, the mosasaur bit the fish, and they both died. How crazy is that? Second in line and trying his very best to become the dominant predator in the world's oceans. Now, at the end of the Cretaceous, when the extinction event happened that killed off the dinosaurs, and we get the, the beginning of the tertiary period or tertiary era, all of the marine reptiles, the mosasaurs, the huge fish like Zephactinus got wiped out, and the ocean started to form into what we have today. For a good period there, sharks became and really in a lot of ways still are the dominant predator in the ocean. But uh, around 40 million years ago, uh, whales started to appear. And whales and dolphins today are actually the shark's biggest competition for dominance in the ocean ecosystems. 
I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. I heard my, my timer go off. Uh, does anybody have any questions or uh, want to see any of these fossils a little closer up? Yeah, go ahead. What, 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 what was the Megalodon big for? Well, we think that the Megalodon, kind of like T-Rex, it got big so that it could eat bigger prey. Um, when predators get large, it allows them to eat larger animals uh, without taking the risk from, uh, from injury, right? So if you're, if you're really tiny uh, and you go attack something that's really large, all it has to do is step on you. And like cavemen had that problem with woolly mammoths. But if you get really big, like the size of two school buses and you wanna go eat that same animal, it's a lot easier to do. Uh, over time, we'll see a pattern in evolution where the prey animal gets too big to eat and the predator gets big enough that it can eat it. So the prey animal gets too big to eat again and back and forth until you end up with huge animals like blue whales or megalodon sharks. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Anybody else have any questions? Could a megalodon eat a mosaicer or whatever they're called? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Could a megalodon eat a mosaicer or whatever? Oh, um, so if they, uh, if megalodon and mosasaur had existed in the ocean at the same time, then absolutely, yeah. Uh, megalodon sharks were larger than the largest mosasaurs, uh, at least the, the largest ones that we know of. And uh, actually they would have lined up very much, uh, very much like Megalodon did with its preferred prey with whales because mosasaurs tended to hunt near the surface and had to breathe air just like whales. Megalodons, uh, as they hunted whales, we think they swam very close to the bottom in deeper water like great white sharks do and waited until their prey uh, went to the surface to breathe and then they would come up from underneath and attack. So the mosasaur being very much like the whales would be vulnerable in that moment to a megalodon shark attack. Uh, but they were separated by about 50 million years, so they never got the chance to, uh, to interact. Uh, neat fact, though, in the modern oceans off of South Africa, there is an area where they say that the great white sharks can fly. And what, what it is, the underwater geography is kind of unique in this area. There's shallow water that comes out to a cliff. And the sea lions that are coming up to shore and uh, going out to sea to fish from the beaches in this area have to go over this cliff face. Now, in the deep water, the great white sharks kind of sit and wait and they're hunting for when the seals come over that edge into the deep water and they swim up and hit the seal very near to the surface. But the attack has so much force, the shark is moving so fast that they actually end up jumping out of the water. And you can get 15 to 20 foot sharks that completely clear the water. Uh, it's a really, really crazy thing to see. I know there's videos of it on uh, places like YouTube that you can look up. Uh, Megalodon probably wouldn't clear the water like that. Uh, and it wouldn't want to because it was so big and heavy, it could get injured when it splashed down. But they probably hunted in very much that fashion stalking from beneath and attacking from below. All right, I think we got, we got time for another question or two if anybody's got one. Going once, going twice. Yeah. Could a Dunkleosaurus be Eaten by a megalodon? Oh, the, the uh, Dunkleosteus? Uh, yeah. This guy? Yeah. 
Uh, now, if these two fish encountered each other, uh, that one I'm really not sure about. So Dunkleosteus was probably about half the length of a full-size Megalodon shark, but with that super tough, thick armor plating and jaws almost as strong as a T-Rex, it would be a really tough nut to crack for a Megalodon. Megalodons, like modern sharks, they, uh, they're covered in skin. Their skin has very fine kind of sharp scales, but they're really soft. They're completely unarmored. They have cartilage skeletons. Uh, I, would, I, I, would not, uh, I would not know who to say would win that particular competition, honestly. Um, but the, the Dunkleosteus did keep sharks kind of at the bottom of the food chain for uh, several million years. So if it caught a small one, I would say it could definitely eat it, but I don't think it would bother a full grown Megalodon. I know there are some folks that have, uh, have questioned whether Megalodons are still alive today or whether they're completely gone. And I, uh, I promise you, Megalodon is completely extinct. Uh, just like the dinosaurs, they're, they're gone. Uh, because of the way they feed and the type of animals they feed on, if there were any swimming around in the oceans today, we would actually see evidence of it in their, uh, in their feeding, in their, their attacks, their kills. Um, because they were eating whales and they have such a large and distinct bite and a specific way of feeding, we know for certain that they're completely gone. Just like our Mosasaurs and Dunkleosteus, uh, all we can really do is try to guess who would win if you put them together. But uh, I heard my, my alarm go there for we're out of time. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed our, uh, our little swim through the ancient oceans and uh, learned a lot about these sea monsters. Uh, next week, we're gonna be talking about sky monsters, some, well, real life dragons, some bats, even some early birds, and maybe some things that you never even heard of before. Got some really awesome toothy monsters to talk about just before Halloween. So thank you everybody for joining us here at Colossal Fossils for Sea Monsters. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed the program and we'll look forward to seeing everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. There we go. Bye. Bye. Everybody.